The reason we moved down to Harvey Bay was that um, I wanted to get out, I wanted to have a better life for my kids. A lot of people walk down the street and they don't want to see, you know, the truth. They don't want to see people on the street because they don't care because it, it screws up their perfect reality. There's got to be some very, you know, um, deep wounds there, psychological wounds for these kids to be coming down here and trying to block off the reality. And you, you can hallucinate, like, different colours of paint have different chemicals in it. If, I, if there was only one thing I could ever have on this planet, it would be paint. I thought I was doing the right thing by taking my kids from Shubert to Harvey Bay, but um, to no avail, because this is where I lost my daughter. telling everyone you know she was a lovable rogue that girl she had the biggest heart she had the kindest heart that kid she could be a real cow of a kid on her day but but when she wasn't sniffing and wasn't you know going off the wrong side of the track she's a beautiful kid she had the biggest heart and the kindest heart that girl and that girl would give you the shirt off her back that that's how good that kid was We, we, had, we got a lot of good memories of her, but it's just on her day, like I keep saying, on her day, she's a beautiful kid. But when she was stressed and when she was looking for a, a smoke or looking to have a sniff, she was the worst kid that you could ever imagine, you know. And then when she had that little girl, that was it. She never told me she was pregnant with Shante, she told my sister. And my sister turned around and said to her, well, the best thing you can do, Bob, is go and tell your mum now. And I said, well, that's not a problem. We'll deal with it. And I said, we'll help you through it. And that's what exactly what we done. We went right through her pregnancy. I went with her into labour. And for a young girl to take all that pain to, to give birth to that baby, I was ever so proud of my girl. I think she started crumbing in Sherbrooke. That, that's my, that's our suspicion anyway. But wasn't full on into it up there. She wasn't full on into to crumbing up there. But when she come down here to the bay, she, she really got stuck into it. Cause she used to steal, she'd steal her little cans from Solly's, and um, or buy it in Woolworths. I, I saw her one day buy it in Woolworths. And I growled her big time. But she said, Mum, you shouldn't be look, looking at what I'm buying. And I said, well, you're not 18 yet, bub. You're still under my care and control. I'm still your mother. But no matter what, what she said to her, you know, she just... She just had her own little mind to make up. You know, she just thought she could do whatever she likes, when she likes, and how she likes. You know what I mean? Not a problem. She'd, she'd just run with it. She wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't, she wouldn't back down. And always one to stern and, and back chat and, you know, give it to you. You know, you wouldn't, wouldn't be Hated the police, big time. And that's what I kept on saying when, when she died, that um, they tried to tell me in the inquest that uh, run, she ran from uh, council workers in the gardens, but Leanne wouldn't have run from council workers. She'd have run from police. And, and I know in my heart, that's how, how, how it happened. Well, what, 
what happened was this, this was a Friday morning. She'd gotten up, then she got Aaron Shante fed, bathed, and ready to cruise. And I drove them from here down to Botanical Gardens. But I never went straight to the gardens. I dropped her off at Woolies, see, just with her on the side there with a the bus stop. And she must have went over to Woolworths, got her little cans, and then she went straight to the gardens. Elga dropped me off at Bingo. And about up past, it might have been quarter past 12, up past 12 that Friday, Elga was waiting outside the RSL there. And I walked out and walked over to him, and I, I, I saw him, and, and I looked at him, and he had tears just rolling down here. And I said, hey, what's the matter, Dad? He recognised, I said, we lost Leanne. I said, oh, don't, 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 no, 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 no. No, I said, no, this can't be. I said, only dropped that girl off in the morning. No, he said, she died. So with that, me and Elga went from the RSL up to the hospital. And when we got to the hospital, they must have put a little tube in her mouth, you know, because she still had the tube stuck in her mouth. And she was lying on this bed. And I walked in and I seen her lying there. And, oh, it was just, it was horrible, you know, just to see her. When I went over to her, I thought her little eyes flicked up. And I was going off at the sister, you know, I said, I just want to hurry up and try and help her. I said, do something for her. I said, get that tube out of her mouth. And I said, and give her mouth to mouth or something, you know. But I reckon Mrs. Harrison, she's not here, she's dead. And that's what cut me right up to see my baby lying up there. And then after that, I come back home here. And uh, the first kid I seen was my Robbie. Oh, trying to tell him about his sister. Because you've you got to understand that that was, that was the only girl in our family, you know. And her brothers idolised her. Her brothers checked her, her brothers flogged her. You know, they all had their little hit at her, just to stop her from chroming. But she just wouldn't take any notice, you know, to no avail. And when I went to Robbie and I said to Robbie, I said, you've got no more sister, Bob. I was looking for Shantae. I didn't know where Shantae was. And Annie Mally and Annie Rossi um, went down the police station. I was on the verge of giving my little granddaughter to foster care, you know, until only Mally and only Rossi went down there. They said, no way in the world you've given that baby to foster care. She going to her grandparents. My mum, but I had a bit of a fallout. She wanted me to go up to uh, well, what's it, Tin Can Bay, and but I was coming off the tablets and everything because I used to be a bad heroin addict and everything and that, and also suffered from a heart condition and everything. And I didn't want to go, and um, so she goes, Well, you're not staying home then. So I said, Fine, so I packed my bags and I moved out under the bridge, probably around about nearly close to two years. They called the Goodwill Bridge. 
but I don't see too much goodwill about it. With this bridge, a lot of the people that cross it and everything, I see a lot of judgmental people, I see a lot of prejudice, a lot of vindictive people, I see a lot of racism. There's good and bad in everyone, I've noticed. You get the ones that are dickheads, that just, once they're finished with the can, that leave a few holes in it and they leave it out in a mess and they make a bad name for it. As we are myself, I can sit down, I can do it in moderation. I can sit down and not freak out be an idiot. But you get the young ones and when they're crammed off their heads and whatever else and that, they'll steal and they'll do everything. And I'll try and lead them out of it as much as I can. I'll try and bring it on, bear it on their consciences as well. Say, come on, look, brothers or sister girls, you know. I call them brother boys and sister girls. Say, come on, look, you know. I'm trying to help his out here, but you know, what he's doing is wrong. You know, I've, I've lost a lot of good friends. There's a bit of pain there that I try and block out as much as I can. And that's probably why I hit the chrome in a little bit myself. I've tried weaning myself off it, but it is too difficult. It is too difficult. It's worse than trying to come off heroin or anything like that. It seems to entrap you in such a way like, um... So, look, if I didn't have any today, I'd be out like a light. I'd be camping all day. I'd be sleeping. Just my body would just, just, just be run down. When you're on it, it does give you the symptoms like that you, you feel like a 30 foot tall missile proof, you feel like you're Superman on it. It's a cross between speed, ice and a trip all in one go. Um, however, like I said, I do, I do it in moderation. I didn't wake up this morning because I didn't sleep. And yeah, coppers came and confiscated our bottles and one of our cans. But we had no one staff. One of the things that the thing that has really concerned us with sniffing and chroming in Brisbane over the last six months has been the 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 increase in chroming, but also just the increase in the diversity of people that are actually chroming. It's more of a relaxant a chrome because it's cheaper than going to get other drugs. You know, it's going to cost me three fifty to get high. Kids as young as you know five and six, uh, sniffing paint on a regular basis. If you sniff white, you see pink clouds. <laughs> right through the spectrum to you know people that are in the fifties and sixties also sniffing paint. I walk around the city too. And, but I don't sniff paint myself, but I see everybody else sniffing it. I never like chrome, but I did sniff quick grip. Just the amount of sniffing that's going on is just continuing to escalate. It's just easy to get, and all the little kids, you know, they feel like they don't have any hope left. They just do it because it's cheap and it's easy, and, you know, they can try and forget about the fact that they got nothing. Well, it's cheap. I mean, it's... I mean, I, I, first time I tried it, I'd been doing it for a week and I didn't even know I was doing it until the cans ran out. Um, the black one, the matte black, so you just, that is just yeah, spit matte out. Black. looks like the yeah. whole world, a whole yeah, car. Black it it keeps you calm and everything. You're not yourself. You don't know mm. anything other than, you know, like you're not, you're not sad. Blue, that just gets you so high, you go crazy. Purple just makes you be really, really quiet. I'll sniff clear and hallucinate, but he'll sniff clear and not feel it. Silver just makes you go crazy and swear and shit. <laughs> and gold too. If they're in their family environment or in their cultural environment for, for many of the Indigenous young people, they will tend to sniff a lot less. 
when they're hassling us, one, one's because we're streeties, another because we've found an easier way to get off our guts without going out and using illegal substances. They're always saying, you know, they can't help you unless you help yourself, but how? I mean, like, you can't get a job without an address, you can't get an address without money, which you need a job for to do, you know, like, the big circle that way. Oh, there's not much the couples can do, really. Yeah. All they can do is take the pain off them. Why should they hassle us for chroming or sniffing? When we're not using an illicit drug, we're using something we can buy at the shops. It's legal, and until they do something about that, they're going to have the same problem. I just reckon they really disturb kids, and that's their way of getting out of reality. Let us be. Let us be, that's it. Just leave us alone. Let us do what we want to do. The street is, uh, the the street street is, is completely different. The street has got nowhere to live as it is, so they may as well not hassle us to say, I'll go find somewhere to live. I mean, we'd go out and find somewhere to live if we had the money to pay the rent. What they are actually doing is not going to repair itself. You know, people who give up smoking, people who give up other kinds of substances, uh, there's a, a degree to which stuff, you know, our bodies can self-repair, but, but for the paint sniffers, that's not going to happen. Yeah, we're heading to this spot, this car full of, full of lads, a bunch of yuppies. They drive past and they're all, like, yelling out, oh, Fuck off with your sniffing and rah, this and that. It's an idiot drug, man. Anyone can use it. It's pretty addictive too. I, I mean, reckon, you don't but even... I don't know if it's addictive you... off the paint or I don't know if it's you addictive You could give a off tin of paint field. to someone that's never even seen a tin of paint and said, here, get high off this, and you'd know what you'd to do with it. I think there's probably as many issues as there are sniffers, really. Um, you know, there are so many chromers out there and everyone has their own reason. I never actually got along with the kids that I grew up with, like the two sisters I grew up with. And we're still, my older one, Katie, um, the one she's, um, I, think she, I think she's like 18, I'm not sure, even. Um, they used to pick on me a lot. He used to beat me up a lot, yeah, like start fights and shit. And, I mean, I had a bad history. A lot of, I, I don't know, I don't want to talk about it. I've seen, I've seen all forms of abuse and what these kids have gone through. Kids that have lost their families or, or, or their mothers that are too selfish and that um, they want to get drinking all charged up and touched the drugs and everything that, that they have no responsibility looking after their kids. You know, that's that angers me. A lot of kids have been sexually abused. I was abused as a kid myself. Um, there's a lot of molestation. There's a lot of verbal abuse. There's a lot of physical abuse. I'll be a funeral. Biggest mob of people. All their people come from all over. They did traditional too, which was was really good because when when their brothers carried their coffin to the ground to place in the ground, they had the Crawberry boy playing the did you know, playing the did you do, and that's where they put it down there up in Paulson Cemetery. And that's why I'll never ever leave Arby Bay now. This will be my home and I'll, I'll get buried up there beside it. When it's my time to go, you know. I sit down where her little grave and I talk to her like I'm talking to you. What do I say to you? Crowman gonna kill you. That's gonna take your life. Did you listen to mummy and daddy? I don't think so. Otherwise you would not be here. Like 
there are points, you know, that I really, really sometimes wish I'd never been born, you know, like that, that, you know, like, I don't know, it's, it just gets so hard sometimes that you just, you wish you were dead. And the heartache and the sadness that you feel day in and day out. And, and we live with that 24-7. But we have a granddaughter that's the constant reminder 24-7. And that's the mother growing up all over again. Oh, I never let that little girl go down that road. No way. Over my dead body, she go down that road. I'd wake up in hospital and the first thing that would come to my head would be, why won't they let me die? You know, like, why wouldn't they just allow it? Like, I don't jump anymore, but, I mean, given half the chance, right now, I probably would. I said, that could only tell me one thing, sister. But she's up in it. I said, praise the Lord. And, and that's, that's true, Jason. I believe that, you know. Because uh, I, I believe that's where she's gone. And I'll be going there to meet her. You know? I, I promised her that. I'll, I'll be there to meet her. But to us, that's our dream job. I meet her in the dream job. That'll be a day of rejoicing. When you're dead, there's nothing, you know, like, many people that tell you, you know, like, the pearly gates or some crap like that, but there's just nothing, you know, you're just free, there's nothing anymore, there's no pain, there's no, no, no discrimination, there's, there's no one there to put you down, you know, and the pain, well, when you're high, you just forget. You can see the mother in that little girl every bit. Just her little ways, her little tantrums, and and the way she liked to back answer and you know tell you no in certain terms, no nanny, you know. And I was thinking, you know, you every bit like your mother, Baba Truth. On the wings of despair. Yeah. 